Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hey, and welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week's guest is Mike Boyle. Mike is one of the all-time greats in strength and conditioning up there with guys like Dan John and Charles Poliquin. Many of you have probably heard me tell the story of my days as a strength and conditioning coach at Southern Utah University. I was working long hours, didn't have many friends, and so when I would get home from work, all I would do was scour the internet for everything I could find on strength and conditioning, kinesiology, etc. And Mike Boyle's articles were one of the things that really inspired me to continue coaching and to learn more about how the body works and how we can train it. In this show, we talk about his joint by joint approach. This is something that was really a paradigm shift for the way that I look about look at the body. We talk about something that he wrote a while back called 25 years, 25 mistakes, something that we can all learn from the importance of simplicity and how it relates to strength and conditioning. We talk about a Dan John adage that we both love, which basically goes like, if it's important, you should train it every day. And then we talk about what he's changed his mind on in the past couple of years. One of the things that I really, really admire about Mike is he's one of the best in the world at what he does. And he always takes a strong stance on, the, on what he teaches. But he, his ego is not so big that he won't change his mind on something. And he's really well known for this. He'll write a book or make a DVD on something. And then a year or two later, he's changed his mind and upgraded it for something even better, which I really, really admire. So before we get started on this show, if you haven't done so already, please head to iTunes and leave me a quick review. And if you want to keep up to date on all of the content that we're putting out, videos, blog articles, podcasts, head to brutestrengthtraining.com and sign up for the newsletter. Enjoy the show. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today, man. Thank you for having me. I love doing these. It's a real honor to have you on the show because being a young strength coach only, only you know a handful of years ago, I remember being in Cedar City, Utah. I didn't have any friends in the city and I was working about 10, 12 hours a day, but every minute that I had outside of work, I spent on Testosterone Nation and and websites like that, just devouring article after article. And you were one of the guys that I I had to read everything that you put out because it I, it really resonated with me and I just looked up to you so much as a coach so it's uh it's a it's a real honor to be here interviewing you today so thanks for making some time for me man no problem thanks for having me like I said I really do enjoy doing this it's amazing how podcasting has just exploded I find it's one of my big uh, kind of areas to gain knowledge now because it's so easy to be in the car for a long ride. I was sort of telling you in the when we spoke before, my daughter plays at a hockey at a school that's six hours away. So the six hours goes pretty quick when you can hop in the car and pop a couple of podcasts on, you know, exactly. your and you're off to the races. Exactly. So I know you as someone that is constantly upgrading his thinking for better ways of thinking. Uh, you'll write a book or make a DVD taking some kind of strong stance on something, but then a couple of years later, you'll change that stance for, you know, some better way of doing things. And I think a lot of coaches and, and internet trolls over the years have given you a lot of shit about this, but I see it as a huge positive. Um, and as a young coach, this had a, a huge effect on not only the way that I coached and viewed strength and conditioning, but also the way that I thought about life. So in an industry where coaches are still like some coaches are still training baseball players like power lifters and so many people are just so stuck in their ways. What do you think has always made you different? What, where did you get that quality of open mindedness mindedness well, from? I think it's interesting. And, I, and I've said this probably over and over again to people is that you should never be punished for learning. And I always go back to that. I think it was Henry 
Ford who said, if I'd listened to everybody else, I would have invented a faster horse. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, it's just, to me, it just made sense. The idea that I understand that, you know, whenever anybody asks me, they say, Mike, do you know the best way to do this? And I'm like, yeah, the way we're doing it right now. Because if I knew a better way to do whatever it was we were going to do, that's the way I would be doing it. I wouldn't, I never do anything to, um, you know, I'm not married to anything. That's what I tell everybody. I'm not married to any idea. I'm not married to any concept. And I actually tweeted something the other day because uh, I said I cling to my opinion until someone smarter than me tells me I'm wrong. And and I've had, like you said, I've had those you know epiphany moments. I can remember listening to Stuart McGill one time talk and think, okay, this guy spent his whole life, you know, sticking electrodes in people's backs and looking at pig right. spines and doing all this stuff. And here I here I am thinking that. I might know more than he does. And he's, he's saying, don't crunch. You know, this is how you blow up a disc. Do crunches. And it's like, okay, we're not going to do crunches anymore. If I showed you sort of our old core stuff from even maybe 15 years ago, you'd be like, I can't believe you did that stuff. You say don't do any of that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but I was doing at the time what everybody else did, what I thought. I thought it was best practice. Mm -hmm. And I think, and that was even like the whole functional training thing. I can remember going to my first Gary Gray seminar and hearing Gary Gray talk about functional anatomy and just sitting there like thinking, holy shit. You know what I mean? This guy's like blowing me away, but in like an indisputable way in terms of, I still remember it. I, I use his demonstration all the time. He talked about muscle function. He said, it's really simple. When you put your foot on the ground, every muscle in your lower body does the same thing. It decelerates flexion. And I was kind of sitting in the audience going, yeah, you're right. He said, and then when you push off the ground, every muscle in your lower body does the same thing. They create extension. You know, he's like, there's no, you know, dorsiflexors or plantar flexors or knee flexors or hip extensors. He was like, they all do two things all the time. And I just remember sitting there going, oh my God, this guy is so right. And everything I learned in school is so wrong. But I never for a moment thought to try to defend my point or, you know, defend where I was like, okay. It's almost like, I think in strength conditioning, it's like war. People are like, no, I staked out this ground and I'm going to defend it to the death. I'm going to keep defending this no matter how wrong I am. Well, I'm going to defend my little piece of turf here until I'm completely obliterated. Right. You know, where I'd look at it and be, no, okay, this guy just made a great point. He's smarter than me. He's right. Okay. Time to go home and change some things around. And even I can remember the first time I heard Charles Pollock would talk about paired sets and he just threw the math up on the board, you know, we were at a seminar and he said, you know, you want to rest five minutes between sets to get stronger. He said, if you rest five minutes between sets, the maximum number of sets you can get is 12 done in an hour. That's math. And I was like, okay, you're right. <laughs> That's math. Okay. You know, he said, so now if you want to do, you know, how many exercises can you do? How many sets can you do? And he's like, if you pair them, you know, and you rest two minutes between each exercise, and I was like, yeah, you get twice as much done in an hour. And I was with my old assistant at the time, and I said, we got to go back and redo all the workouts. He's like, why do we have to do that? And I'm like, because he's freaking right. It's just math. we got to start pairing exercises the way that he's saying you should pair exercises. That makes more sense if we're looking to maximize our time in the weight room. And then I was a college strength coach, and obviously time is a, is a really big commodity as a college strength coach because you only basically have after school. You might have, you know, whatever, two to seven or something like that to train the kids. So the ability to get more done in an hour really made a difference. Then you get into the private world and time is an even greater, more valuable quantity. So I guess all of these things, that's why, that's why kind of, I laugh at people when they're, when they're critical. I always it's like, you know, what am I going to do? I'm not going, okay, don't read, don't study. Don't try to get any smarter. Just wherever you are, stay there and defend your point. Right. And somehow that'll make you better. It just defies any logic that's possibly out there. I think the interesting thing is that, especially with, I think that the, the earlier for anyone, the earlier in, like when you get involved in any discipline, the more your ego is kind of trying to protect itself and what it believes. And so a lot of young, whether it be coaches or teachers or any, any, anyone in any discipline, right. When they, um, right. When they enter that discipline, they don't know a lot, so they just try to protect themselves by protecting their beliefs. 
when you were first starting out, did you still have this same open-mindedness or were you a little more defensive? That's an interesting question. I don't know, to be honest, because I, I was very lucky. So if you've ever, um, have you read Outliers? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, when they talk about this hothouse idea, I was lucky in the sense that I ended up at Springfield College in 1977. And my dorm director was a guy named Mike Wojcik, who, if you follow the National Football League, is the longest tenured strength coach in the National Football League. And the man with the most Super Bowl rings, more than Tom Brady. He has six Super Bowl rings. But he was my dorm director. So I walked right into this guy who was so far ahead of the rest of the world in 1977. He was talking about plyometrics and Olympic lifting and all of these things. And I just knew he was smarter than everybody else. I didn't realize exactly where he sort of was going to be on the scale. And then my, the guy that was teaching my weight training class had just come from Hawaii working for Bill Saar and brought with him Bill's Strong Shall Survive, which again, if you think in 1978 or nine, whatever year it was, it was pretty progressive stuff at that time. So I always felt like I had a huge head start in terms of the things that we were doing and the people that I was around. And so um, I think I've kind of always been this way, but I don't know. You might meet somebody who knew me when I was younger. He'd be like, no way you were cement head just like the rest right. of them. And, and maybe I was, but my memory of that at, at 58 is that I wasn't that way. But I, my athletes now, I have athletes cause I've coached, I have athletes that I coached who are older than I am. Cause I started coaching in college when I was 21 mm -hmm. and we had some kids that were 22. So I have some athletes that I've coached who are 59 years old. And I'll still meet athletes who'll say, we were so far ahead of everybody else at that time, but I, we didn't know it in terms of the things. I mean, we were doing unilateral trade. We were using heart rate monitors, I think, in the 80s in terms of, you know, I had bought polar heart rate monitors and I had, you know, was looking into like Conconi's test and all these things about, you know, how to understand and, you know, utilize heart rate. And we were doing unilateral training and I didn't, again, I don't think I knew it, but I, I think the one thing I did, and I always say this to people, one thing that I was good at was, I think I always had kind of a good bullshit detector and a good filter. So when I went to a seminar and listened to somebody, I could be like, I could come away and think, wow, that's a smart guy. That's a guy I got to listen to. So I was listening to Don Chu and Vern Gambetta and Gary Gray and guys like that right off the hop. And I think, again, that gave me a really big advantage because I sort of, I found the right people. I wasn't, and I was, a, you know, I was, safe. I was a power lifter. I was very heavily involved on the strength side, but I, as I've always said, I don't know if there's a ton of people in that world who gave up their Mensa memberships to, uh, to, to follow that particular, um, you know, line of training. And so the guys that I tended to gravitate more were more like physical therapists, track and field people, who I thought maybe had a had a leg up on the average kind of you know meatheads you know squat bench deadlift kind of strength coach. Right. So you were just in a you were surrounding yourself with a variety. It sounds like you were surrounding yourself with a variety of different people with different ways of thinking about the body. Yeah, and, and with in all honesty, probably with not great intention, but it was definitely happening that way. So. Um, Meaning you didn't uh, you didn't really have a, a clear intention about why you were doing that. Yeah, doing that? I don't think. Uh, yeah, I don't think I really knew what I was doing in the beginning, except that I was maybe a little bit better at looking and thinking. I I don't know about that. That doesn't make as much sense. But right. slowly over time, I think that stuff is cumulative. Where you can continually, even now, you start looking at you know whether it's you know reading Franz Bosch's stuff or. It's almost, you know, it's, they always say the old commercial, the more you know, the more you know, and the more you learn. And I, you know, I've talked about this, but I used to make fun of the yoga people all the time talking about breathing. And I would make the same lame joke, like, hey, all my clients, thank God, are still breathing. So I don't need to teach anybody how to breathe. Mm -hmm. and I, don't, I don't work with any dead people. And, and now I'm embarrassed. I always, <laughs> right. you know, when I get up at a seminar, I always apologize. Like, I want to apologize to all you yoga instructors. I still don't like you. I still don't think yoga is a good idea. But I apologize about the breathing part because I was completely wrong. And I'm not, same thing, I'm not embarrassed. I think if you're good at something and you're smart, 
you look better and smarter when you stand up in front and say, hey, here's a bunch of stuff I've been wrong about over the course of my career. Yep. Here's why I think I, you know, here's not why I think I was wrong. Here's why I know I was wrong. Because mm-hmm. we've, I've been looking up, looking at like nasal breathing. The respiratory therapists have been talking about nasal breathing for 30 years. We just have ignored them because you're thinking the same thing. Respiratory therapists, I don't have anybody with congestive heart failure. You know, I don't have that. That's not my crowd. So why should I worry about that? And now, again, you listen to people talk about breathing and how important nasal inhale is and how important diaphragmatic breathing is and how important the diaphragm is. I remember thinking when. One of my physical therapist friends, Sue Falsoni, said the diaphragm was her favorite muscle. I can remember sitting there and going in my head, is it even a muscle? That was the thought I had. Is that a muscle? I don't ever remember anybody saying that was a muscle. And now, again, I look at that stuff and think, oh, my God. Hopefully, I didn't say any of these things out loud, which I know I did. But Sure. So, so. In, t- in today's day and age, I think that mastery – of any discipline is becoming more and more rare because there are so many distractions and over the course of someone's life and career, there's so there's more opportunities than ever to what do you attribute your ability to stick to your discipline for now? I think it's over 35 years as a strength and conditioning coach now continuing to strive towards mastery. Um, Probably some of it is rooted in a pretty firm fear of failure, <laughs> okay. which I think is, again, a really good thing. And so it's, you know, I mean, I love the quote. They say, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Mm-hmm. And and I think so a, a big part of it for me has continually wanting to be around people that I find bright and interesting. And, and again, not being afraid. I can remember I went to visit Mark Verstegen. So let's say I'm um, 50, 18 years ago, I went to visit Mark Verstegen and Mark is, uh, I think he's 10 years younger than me. I think he's 48 and I'm 58. So he would have been 30 and I would have been at that time, probably I don't know, you know, 40 years old. And I could have been intimidated by the fact that here's this hotshot young guy who's getting a lot of attention for what he's doing, training athletes and not wanted to be around him. And instead, I had the exact opposite sensation. The first day I met him, I think I spent three hours with him at lunch going over the plans for what would eventually become sort of the whole Exos empire. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, now, this guy's like the you know a little brother that I lost somewhere along the way. Right. And, uh, and I need to get to know this guy. I need to pick his brain like to death. And I think I've always kind of been that way in terms of I've never really been intimidated by being around people that were smarter or people that knew more or people that I thought I would guess I, I was not, not afraid that someone was going to teach me something. Mm-hmm. Not, not that you should be, but I think in our field, one of the problems with our field is it's a very kind of macho ego driven kind of field just because of like you were talking about, you know, people hey, you want to, you know, want to look better naked. I want to lift heavy weights. And I was talking about sort of the evolution of the strength coach is that like, you know, you want to meet chicks, you want to have a big bench press, you want to be, you want people in the gym to look at you and say, oh, wow, look at that guy or a girl or whatever it is. Right. And unfortunately, that becomes the mindset for a lot of people as they continually move forward. And I like I tell people like that when I'm looking for employees, one of the things I always do is I don't hire that person. I generally have no interest in that person. I, I always, you know, I jokingly say it, but I'm not joking. Sometimes I'm like. You know, I don't want to be around the guy with the Tupperware. You know, when someone shows up and they've got Tupperware with like five chicken breasts in it and, you know, some brown rice that they made themselves and they prepped all their food in advance, you know, and then they want to talk to you about their last workout and how much they lifted. I'm like, oh, God, spare me. Mm -hmm. You know, please don't subject me to this. Because I think, (laughs) you know, that person's totally into it for themselves. Right. And then they thought, oh, and, you know, I look great and I'm good at this and, you know, people will pay me to do it. And I can then talk to them, you know, it's like enough about you. Let's talk about me some more mm-hmm. kind of thing. A- and so I- I've just sort of gone in a completely different direction. We really are in a service business. And you can go through this whole process when you talk about the whole idea that, and one of my, uh, well, I always, I always say the idea that people don't care how much you know until they know how much mm-hmm. you care, which I think is true. And then my good friend, Bob Alejo, 
wrote back and was like, bullshit, everybody cares how much you know. Nobody wants to work out with someone who doesn't know anything. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, you're kind of right about that. So I guess people, they want you to know something and they want you to care about that. Right. So you, you can't be an idiot who cares. Exactly. But you also can't be someone who doesn't care and who isn't. It is a client-centered and athlete-centered business. And you have to accept, you got to get to a point, you know, if it's all about you, you'll never really be good at this. Yeah, I think the point is that both are important, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm, I'm, I've become much less of like, I the people who are always like, oh, you know, if you don't walk the walk, all that stuff, I'm like, shit, you don't want to see me with my shirt off then, Jesus. You know, I, it's been a long time since I walked the walk. Mm-hmm. And, and the reality is, again, I'm not hiring people who are out of shape. I'm not hiring people who aren't athletes, but at the same time, I really don't want somebody who's so into walking the walk that they're not into kind of walking somebody else along the path. That's more what I'm looking for at this stage. Love it. So I read an article that you wrote a while back called 25 years and 25 mistakes. And I thought it was really interesting about the last five of them were things that had nothing to do with strength and conditioning. So things like not recognizing stress or neglecting my wife or not having kids sooner. If you could go back to your earlier years of your career, do you think that you'd do it differently and institute those things? And if so, why? And do you think it would be, if so, do you think it would be more for a balanced life, to have a more balanced life along the way or in some way to become a better strength coach or both? Um, I don't know if it would have made me a better strength coach. There are definitely things that I would have done differently. And I always tell people this story, but in terms of the neglecting my wife part, I mean, I probably came really close to losing my wife at certain points in time because I was so worried about being good at my job. And that would have been a massive mistake. And I, I've gotten more comfortable at telling this story, but we went to uh, counseling at one point because we were thinking about getting divorced. So we were fairly young. I would say we were probably, I might've been, you know, late thirties at that time. And I can remember thinking, like, this is going to be quick. This, you know, this counselor is going to tell my wife how great I am and how lucky right. she is. And, you know, and, and this, so this will be over in a half hour and I'll be on my way. And we get in there and it was a woman counselor. And I was thinking, okay, two against one. I'm in a little bit of trouble here. And, um, and then the woman started talking to me about what I was doing. And that time it was, I mean, balance, I mean, it was so far out of balance that it was absurd in terms of I was basically working three jobs. I was working, you know, 12 hours was normal and 18 hours was kind of normal in terms of I was working for the Bruins as their strength and conditioning coach. I was working at Boston University. I was just doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was like six in the morning, sometimes till 11 at night and then going out and having beers after and, you know, scraping myself back up the next morning. And I just remember the woman looking at me going, so you think this is normal? And me kind of looking at her like, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm working hard. I'm trying to build a career. You know, I'm trying to, and she was back. So you think this is normal? And I was like, um, maybe, maybe not, <laughs> you know, and it ended up obviously best thing that ever happened to us was that process. But I ended up going in there and getting kind of dope slapped around for probably the first month of thinking like, Hey, just so you know, buddy, this isn't normal. It's not normal. But I grew up in it. You know, my father, you would jokingly and always half jokingly say anybody who had one job was lazy. And so, you know, the idea of having, basically in my case, two sort of full-time jobs to which I was getting part-time money seemed to be a really good idea. And I was, you know, I was being successful. I was getting a lot of attention. I was developing a lot of notoriety. So probably in a lot of those ways, I was a lot like the people I'm talking about right now. Uh, but it, it took me a while. So yeah, there's some of that stuff that I would do differently. And again, you know, not recognizing stress. I mean, and, you know, and, and then thinking that, that, you know, the stress thing was something that I had to look at and think, Hey, you know, is, is that, um, is that a positive or is that, is that a negative? And it was like, it's clearly, it was clearly a negative, but I, you know, you don't perceive it to be that way. You think, Hey, this is the grind. This is what I got to do, blah, blah, blah. And, and you're like, well, that was wrong. I would have done much better had, you know, we never, we took a vacation. I was at our vacation was always the most expensive week of the year between Christmas and New Year's. That's when we went on vacation because that's when school was closed down and everybody was home and there was no one around to train. Right. So I, I spent the most money you could possibly spend on my vacation week 
so that I could make sure I was training everybody. I used to open the weight room on Christmas Eve. You know, I'd open on New Year's Day. And, you know, and these were all things that the kids I trained remember. But they probably weren't good life decisions in my, whatever, my 20s and my 30s. So, yeah. So that's why I wrote a lot of that stuff. And that's, I think, the difference is people, and this is why I always laugh at people when they argue with me. It's like, the only thing I have to share with you is the experience of doing a lot of things wrong and surviving and kind of still being here and still doing it. And so when people don't want to listen, I kind of look it's like, oh, whatever, you know, come back in 10 years and right. tell me I was right. And, uh, you know, we'll be fine. Enjoying this episode? Hit subscribe. We have more amazing content for you every single week. So I've, I've spent some time with and interviewed some of the best strength and conditioning coaches in the world, like Dan John, Joe Ken of the Panthers, Tommy Moffat of LSU. And I know there, there are a couple themes that I've noticed that I want to run by you and, and see if they resonate with you. First off, they all seem to put a serious value on simplicity and the concept of minimum effective dose. How do you feel about that and why? Um, I would absolutely positively agree in terms of, I mean, I think, you know, the, the minimum effective dose thing is one of those things that we're, we're trying harder and harder to get people to understand. And, um, it, you know, and, it, and it's great because somebody, uh, you know, you look, I, somebody said, and I'm trying to think who it was, but, you know, wrote the idea that, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, it doesn't, but basically, you know, a, a little bit is good, but too much is fatal. And there's a, there's a better, um, parable in there, but it's the basic idea that sort of, you know, two aspirin might get rid of your headache, a bottle of aspirin will kill you. And people have to realize that. And I think we've become, again, obviously, and I, I know, cause I've, I've looked at your background, you come from the, you know, sort of the CrossFit world, you know, which sometimes was more like maximum effective dose, you know, what's right. the most we can possibly give you. And then see if you can survive it. Mm -hmm. So yes, I would say that. And the problem with simplicity, I think simplicity is really relative. In the sense, I firmly believe that things should be really, really simple. But uh, there, again, I wish I had the quote in front of me. But there's an Einstein quote that says something like, "Everything, you know, should be as simple as possible, but not too simple." You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to look at it and think. Some people might look at what we're doing and think, "Wow, you, this is so complicated." And I might look at it and think, well, this is as simple as we can make it. But I, I was having a conversation on internet, you know, whatever, back and forth with somebody the other day. And one of the things he said is that complexity increases with time in terms of you're going to work expands to meet time. If I've got four days a week, two hours a day, what I'm going to do is going to be very different than if I have two days a week, one hour a day. So my in-season athlete approach is going to be entirely different from my off-season athlete approach. And so it will always be as simple as it can possibly be, given the amount of time that I'm being provided in order to provide, you know, to, to produce that result. Right. Yeah. The quote I think is everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Yes. Ex that's exactly it. There you go. Good job. And that's, it. and I think that's true. So when you look at that and say as simple as possible, but not simpler, and that's why sometimes people say, yeah, just do push ups and squats. And I'm like, uh, that might be that might be too simple you know you might need to be a little more complicated than that but if you said to me i saw a great jim wendler talk one time and i always said people of all people jim wendler was talking about training high school kids and that's what he said he was like gobble squats and push-ups that's all we did and i was like <laughs> right you know and it, but it was a great talk because you realize if i had a lot of kids and not a lot of time and not a lot of equipment that might not be a very bad prescription mm -hmm. and i find i do that like i train my i have a uh, 13 year old son and we tend to do like uh, you know squat ch you know chin up bench press hang clean I mean because he's got two hours twice a week and we keep it really really simple and you know he doesn't do like I said sometimes too it's relative like we don't do like fancy core stuff you know someone might look at what we're doing and say oh you know what you're doing with your kids are so simple and I'm like yeah because that's all it needs to be right but again, we want to look at it and think not, as you said, not, not too simple. Yeah. It's but funny. It, it's funny. You bring Jim up. I, I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago and he said that he, I think it, it's either six or eight exercises that he exposes his athletes to. That was fascinating. Um, yeah. 
But that's like for us, I, I told you I'm working on this youth training program, but that's one of the things that we talked about was if someone said to me, okay, I want to train kids, and I'm like, okay, get them good at a, a single leg hip pinch pattern, what we would call a one leg straight leg deadlift pattern. We've got to get them good at the hang clean. We've got to get them good at the gobble squat. We've got to get them to be able to do chin-ups. We've got to get, get them to be able to do bench press. It would probably be the same thing. It would probably be somewhere around six exercises that we would be consistently exposing these mm-hmm. kids to. And then as they got older and got more proficient, we might gra- gradually expose them to to more variations of these things. So the other thing that I've observed from these masters is that some, some, some form of strength and conditioning for most athletes has a very limited impact on their actual performance in their sport. Uh, it may contribute only like 5% to their performance on the field or on the court. Uh, is this something that you believe? And if so, what's your, what, what is your main objective with an athlete whose sport is on a field or a court and not in a weight room? Yeah, I don't believe that at all, to be honest. But uh, I think I think we have to be careful that we don't overstate our own value. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, we at five percent probably is. I think at five percent, I'd be like, why do it? Why be a coach as in a strength and conditioning coach if you really thought you could have a five percent effect? Mm-hmm. I feel like, and I don't know, I I don't know what the number is, but I know that it's not, or I don't at least think that in my mind it is 5%. I think I just made that number up. I just heard, I've okay. heard some version of it. It's, it's a, it's a very limited, um, limited effect. Yeah. And, and I, again, I, and I, I don't think so. No. I mean, when I look at the effect, at least I feel like the athletes that I've dealt with, just the fact that they've been incredibly healthy, mm-hmm. um, is is really significant. And if you could say that that's worth 5%, I'd say I don't think so. Mm-hmm. When you start thinking about career longevity and the ability to to last longer in a particular sport, I, I would not I would I would think that it's much more significant. And when you think that somebody will dedicate their entire off season to the strength and conditioning process, I would look at it and think even the athletes themselves probably believe that it's much because to me, if it was 5%, if it was 95%, whatever else they were doing, then I would really look at it and see, um, I don't know why they're doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting take. Uh, what I'm hearing especially is maybe maybe we don't get, maybe athletes don't get a huge direct performance increase from strength and conditioning. And maybe a lot of times they do, but they're staying healthy longer, which is going to allow them to progress in their in their actual skill and their craft. Whereas if they're injured, they're gonna take huge chunks of time off. Yeah, and and that's what I mean. I, I guess that's one of those things where if you really said, okay, how much is this going to affect their performance? And, and you know, I would always think I have used the, the numbers ten to twenty percent as probably more realistic because I do mm-hmm. think there probably does come up a point where you say, okay, um, you know, I'm not drastically impacting this person's ability to perform, but at the same time, I mean, like I said, I'd look at 5% and think, gee, it's, I'd have to really question the amount of time that we're putting into this process if it was right, 5%. Right. But 10 to 20, you know, especially when you start thinking, uh, and again, depending on the sport and it's uh, relative, I think if we looked at time, you know, if you look at, say, um, an NCAA athlete who might be, they might allow them 20 hours a week of practice time and two hours of that might be strength and conditioning, then now you're around 10%. If you said with sort of warm ups and all the other stuff, maybe 20% of that's going to be strength and conditioning, then I think that's probably more realistic. Right. So one of my favorite <laughs> strength and conditioning books of all time is your joint by joint approach because it really reshaped or shaped in the first place the way that I think about the way the body works. Can you explain this approach a little bit? Uh, talk a little bit about the book? Yeah. Um, so it, it was really an article, not a book. And it was it was basically a um, it was a conversation with Greg Cook, which I think is interesting. So 
And this is one of the things I'd said about it in terms of consistently being around people that are smarter than you. I love being around Gray. I love talking to Gray, even though I don't always necessarily agree with everything he says. He's a really good thinker. And so one day we, I was sort of analyzing the whole movement screening process and basically saying that um, I felt like people who couldn't squat, it was always an ankle mobility issue because 90% of people got better when you elevated their heels. And his response was, yeah, I'd agree with you. He said, because, you know, you just got to understand it's just the joints are just mobile, stable, mobile, stable, mobile, stable. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, ankles need to be mobile. Knee needs to be stable. Hip needs to be mobile. Lumbar spine needs to be stable. And I was like, whoa, slow down there, kid. <laughs> Literally, I, and I wrote, I, I got a bar napkin and I got a, uh, a pen from the bartender and I wrote ankles mobile, knees stable, hips mobile, lumbar spine stable. And I sort of compiled this joint by joint idea in my mind and I'm like oh my god he's absolutely right and then I thought that based on what he's saying he's really explaining to us okay this is how you need to train you know you're not like when you if you talk to people you know how much ankle strength work do you do mm -hmm. uh, basically none you know nobody really is out there doing like you know whatever you know drawing circles you know like ankle rehab you know draw, write the alphabet with your big toe or some of that stuff and um and then you think, well, knee strength, we're doing a lot of that. You know, everything that we're doing probably from a, a squatting knee dominant kind of standpoint is to help increase that, the stability of that joint so that obviously we don't have the, the consummate compromise of stability, the ACL tear, right? Mm -hmm. But then I start thinking about hips and I'm like, wow, hips need to be mobile. He's so right. You know, and that sort of tied in everything that I'd been learning about low back when you're talking about McGill and about the whole idea of sparing the spine and all these things. And you know, realizing that, wow, if I can get somebody's hips to move, then their low back isn't going to move. If I can stop their low back from moving, I'm probably going to make their low back pain go away. So it just, it, it was, again, another one of those epiphanies for me, those ahas where you're thinking, wow, this guy is so right. And I guess one of the other things that I've been good at doing is, is getting these things down on paper and dumbing them down for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things I found, and you've probably encountered this yourself when you interview these guys, some of the really smart people don't know how smart they are, and sometimes things will seem simple to them that really aren't that simple to everybody else. Right. But because they have such a high level of understanding of the topic, they'll tend to sometimes gloss over it. I do it even now. We, we bring people in for seminars, in-house stuff, and sometimes I'll say to people, no, stop and say that again. Repeat that and make that a lot more clear. And they'll kind of look at me and be like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, that's a really, really big point. So I need you to slow down and say that again to make sure that everybody absorbs that point. And it was once I listened to Boo Snackstater. I don't know if you know who Boo is, but he's a great track coach. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. So, and he started talking one time at a seminar and people were kind of checking their phones and kind of talking to each other. And Boo's like a, you know, kind of a slow talking Southern gentleman type of guy. And he was saying these things like he was freaking tossing, you know, like big rock, you know, not I hate the knowledge bomb thing, but he was throwing knowledge bombs around. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple times where I literally wanted to stand up in the seminar and be like, put your phone away. You're not paying attention. You know, this guy just said something incredibly smart, but he kind of drawled it out and said it really <laughs> right. slow. And, and as a result, you probably weren't paying any attention to what he said and you missed it, you idiot. And. And so, you know, I said to him afterwards, I was like, oh my, and I can't remember what the things were at that time. Oh, I know what it was. He talked about hamstrings. He said, yeah, hamstring rehab is basically just a, a velocity continuum. And I was like, oh, you're so right. That's absolutely what it is. And, um, and I'm looking around at everybody else and I'm thinking, oh, they didn't get that. They, that, they whiffed on that one. It went right over their head. Like that was a big, big statement that people missed. And I don't remember. There were like three or four other things that he said, but it was the same for me in terms of, okay, this guy's pretty smart. And it's like, pay attention because this guy's smart. He's going to start saying a lot of really smart things as smart people tend to do. Right. So in the joint by joint approach, each joint has its, its primary function, right? But each joint also needs both mobility and stability. So how do you, how do you marry the two? How does that work? Well, I mean, I think it has both like, you know, that's what people argue. It's like, I, you know, I, I don't think you do marry the two because obviously you want a certain degree of knee mobility. You want sagittal plane range of motion. You want to be able to get your heel to your butt. So I think 
part of it is sort of inherently understanding the common sense about this is that we're not talking about certain joints being fused and certain joints being, you know, capable of circumduction. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes it's more an understanding. It's like understand the concept. And the concept is that we need to focus on keeping the ankle mobile. And the focus is that we need to keep the knee stable. You know, because people are like, oh, knee has to have rotary motion. I'm like, I get it. I said, you know, but I always tell people, what do they call an excess of rotary motion in your knee? They call it an ACL tear. Right. You know, you know what I mean? It doesn't need, it only needs a very limited amount. It, the hip, I always said, I was, you know, I've said this in seminars, the hip is where it's really intriguing because the hip needs two types of motion. It needs uh, a sort of an active and passive motion. It needs to have the passive range and it needs to have the active range. So you've got to be able to get into position sort of whether it's, you know, sitting foot to foot or cross legged or things like that. But you've also got to be able to lift your knee up. You know, one of the things we always do from like from a psoas standpoint is to have somebody sit and then say, can you pick your foot up off the ground in sitting? And you'll find that people with bad backs, if you sit them, say, on a 12 inch box or an 18 inch box or something like that, will have trouble getting their feet off the floor because their deep hip flexors don't work. And then this in the same way you'll have somebody sort of in quadruped and say, okay, extend your hip, but I need you to extend your hip without moving your lumbar spine. And they can't do that. They, they substitute lumbar extension for hip extension. So the, the hip is the most intriguing. And then secondarily, the lumbar spine, you know, people like we don't do any rotary stretching at all. And that's becomes, I, I'll have that argument at least once a year with somebody about lumbar range of motion. I'm like, you have a finite, deliberately constrained lumbar range of motion that you do not need to increase. Right. And, you know, you've got whatever, you know, 10 to 12 degrees of lumbar range. Don't try, you know, whatever, people like whatever book openers and 90, 90 stretches and that kind of stuff. I cringe when I see people do that. I think it's a way to make your back sore because again, that, that, that part of the column in particular was architecturally created to be stable, to accept load from a person who has now become, you know, gone from quadruped to bipedal. Mm -hmm. So when we got upright and started to walk, those vertebrae deliberately changed and got bigger and had less rotational range of motion intentionally because that's what's going to allow us to, to walk upright and to support. There's a reason that your thoracic vertebrae move differently than your lumbar vertebrae. There's a reason there's more. Uh, and I had, Todd Wright did a great talk one time and he, you know, he said, there's a reason there's 26 bones in your foot. If there wasn't, there'd be one, you know? And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. <laughs> all those, they all have a purpose because we realized from an evolutionary standpoint, if they didn't, they wouldn't be there. If we needed tails, we'd still have them. There are all these things that we know that I think are, it kind of goes back, what is it, Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And I think sometimes people lack the ability to see things that are self-evident and want to argue with you about things. And and as I said, the good thing, I always tell our, I tell our coach and our clients, it's great that people don't agree with us. That's way better for us from a business standpoint. Because mm -hmm. if, if you don't have... You know, if you don't have bad competition, that's not good. So it's um, the fact that not everybody kind of sees it the way that we see it probably is beneficial. Right. Well, guys, if you haven't listened to or, or read the article or the book, Joint by Joint Approach, check it out. Uh, great kind of paradigm shifting way to look at the body. I think and that I is on the old, if you put in T Nation, Joint by Joint, that I think was originally, I think I originally wrote that. For T Nation, and and that was I think I uh, I probably think about it, I'm like why did I write it for there and it was probably because they paid me because I think at that time I was, <laughs> nice they were they were paying good money for articles nice so there's a there's a Dan John lesson that I know I know I've seen somewhere you talk about that I I, I really love and it's the uh, this idea that if there's something important to you then you should train it every day which I think is a, a great metaphor for life in general. But why do you, why, why does he say this in, in relation to movement and what does it look like in practical application? Yeah. And I think I thought about that because I wrote a, a little article about Dan one time and I said, he's probably right in the sense that if it's important, do it every day. But I think it's the question of 
how much of it then you do it at what intensity do you do it? Because we always would say that we might do single leg stuff every day and we might call it warm up on one day yeah. when we're doing sort of you know a back lunge or a back lunge to hamstring kind of stretch as we're warming up. And then on another day, we might be doing split squats as an exercise. So I think it's you have to be careful with Dan's stuff because Dan's another one of those guys – I mean, he's a brilliant, he's a brilliant scholar and people forget that when they sort of look at him as a strength coach. So you, with Dan's stuff, you've got to really be able to analyze what he's saying and think about what he's saying because he's really thinking about what he's saying. And so uh, some people would take that thing. That means Dan says we should do squats every day. Right. And it's like, that's not really what he meant. But what he did mean is that you should be doing some squat patterning every day. And if you were going to get into a squat position for hip mobility on days that you didn't squat, that would be good for you. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's sort of that, that ability to kind of translate things. And, and that's where these podcasts are great because sometimes you can ask somebody, Hey, what did you mean by that? And did you mean that we want a seven day a week squatting program? Is that what you meant that we should all be on like a Bulgarian style squat program where we do heavy back squats seven days a week. And he'd be like, nah, that's not really what I meant. Right. Yeah. I think another, and I'm not sure if he meant this, but one thing that I got out of it is, and, and I'm, I'm pulling this from a friend of mine who's the sports psychologist of the Red Sox who says, uh, basically that what separates golden globe, golden globe, not gold, uh, golden glove winners from like the rest are that they're so laser focused on the one thing at a time, right? One thing that they need to improve on at a time rather than just trying to improve their entire game and making like marginal increases. If there's something that's really, really important to us in performance or life, if we focus on that one thing and improve on that one thing daily, then we're going to make a lot faster progress on that big weakness than if we try to do a million things at once. So whether it's squatting every day or just trying to improve your squat by, you know, maybe you have to improve your, your patterns, your mobility, um, your sleep, whatever it may be, as long as you're focused on improving that one thing, you're going to achieve uh, results a lot faster. That's kind of what I got out of it. Yeah. And I, and I guess it, it's, it, that is, and I wouldn't say that's what I got out of it, but because again, I think Dan was talking about, he thinks that there's certain four or five things that you should do every day mm -hmm. in terms of you should carry something every day. You know, you should push something every day. You should pull something every day. And, um, and again, I don't know if I would necessarily even agree with it that way, but, but I did get it. And I think it's also, are you looking to learn something or refine it? I think there's a lot of ways to kind of analyze that and ask yourself, okay, what do I what does that really mean? And maybe more importantly, what does it really mean to me as opposed to, to you know, in, in Dan's particular situation? Because the other thing that I've, and I talk about this a lot, you have to be attentive to everybody's lens because everybody has a lens through which they see things, whether it's intentional or unintentional. And so when somebody, that's one of the reasons I always said, like, I don't want to listen to Gary Gray tell me how to train athletes. Because that's not what he does. And when he does try to tell you how to do that, he's telling you that through the lens of a physical therapist because that's really what he is. And much the same way, I don't want to have a sprint coach tell me how to train everybody because even though unintentionally he may not be telling me how to train everybody like a sprinter, that's his lens. Yep. So I think we've got to be careful to realize, am I getting something through someone else's lens? And that lens, it doesn't necessarily apply in my particular situation. Yeah. So I, I've got to be able, and this is why I said in terms of being able to filter, I had, I, we had great conversations in the fall with this guy, Tony Haller, who's an amazing, sharp track coach, a high school coach outside of uh, Chicago area. And one of the, but one of the things that he said is that I don't care if my sprinters lift. I only care if my sprinters sprint. And all my staff was like, I can't believe you agree with them. I said, I don't agree with them on that particular point. But that doesn't invalidate all the other things he said today. Mm -hmm. It just means that, that I don't agree with that part. And I said, and he's saying that because he's got athletes that are not participating in a contact sport. I said, so even if his feeling was correct, that for what he needs for his sprinters, strength training 
not important. He feels, you know, one of the things he said, which was pretty good, hard to argue with, he was like, you don't do anything in the weight room at 10 meters a second, but we're trying to go 10 meters a second. He said, and going, you know, going 10 meters a second is what gets you to go 10 meters a second. And I was kind of like, yeah, you're right. I mean, it really does make you think about, I, you know, I've talked to people about this the last couple of months. In some ways, I think that high speed, short distance sprinting tens and flying tens and things like that may be a little bit of the training holy grail. If, and again, lens wise, if your goal is to have really fast, explosive athletes, which again, right. if we're the team sport world, speed kills. And I don't care what sport it kills in, it kills it in every one. It doesn't make a difference if it's baseball or soccer or American football or ice hockey. You know, you, I could, you know, you could give you an example of every one of those people in every one of those situations where you think, hey, this is a huge asset for this particular guy. Right. Well, hey, I know you've got only a few more minutes, so I've got one more question and then uh, a couple rapid fires for you. So okay. like I started out, one of, the, one of the things I really admire about you is your ability to uh, honor when you've either made mistakes or changed your mind about something. What, what have you changed your mind about in the past couple years? Well, the biggest one I've said, the two biggest things probably were breathing and sprinting. We always sprinted, but I don't think we sprinted with intention or with intent because we weren't timing sprints. So I think that's the one area, and I would give Tony Holler full credit for that in terms of, he wrote an article that you can look up. I think it's on Simply Fast called Record, Rank, and Publish. And, um, and that made me really rethink some of the stuff that we were doing and, and redo some of the sprinting drills, speed development drills that we were using. So now you're and, measuring it to see if the if your if your program is working. Yep, and uh, we're measuring it every, twice a week. You know, he he, goes, he gets very specific about it, like doing it twice a week, doing it in non-competitive. You you compete only with yourself, no races. Yep. He's like, we only race on race day. He's got a lot of really specific stuff, but it was one of those. I think we were talking about this today in our staff meeting. We probably got a lot of eighty to ninety percent sprinting done, and probably not a lot of hundred percent sprinting done mm -hmm. because we weren't timing. And I think when you start thinking about one, why people pull muscles, that's probably a reason right there in terms of they don't do 100% only comes in a competitive situation that they're not really prepared for. Right. Because they've been doing a lot of 80 or 90. So we're, you know, we got our timer out and twice a week we're doing either time tens or time flying tens. And then breathing is the other one. Because I, I, I just, when you kind of really understand the anatomy of breathing and you start to look at some of the information now that's out there about, nasal breathing and about diaphragmatic breathing and about your, you know, your, um, your autonomic nervous system and your vagus nerve, there's all this stuff that's there, but I just don't think we were smart enough to digest. Yeah. And now, now you kind of look at it and it's like, okay, this is in the like unavoidable, can't argue with this kind of category. And what's, so what's the best again, resource we're not to, to dive into, uh, learning about breath? It's a, it's, it's a really good question. Um, Jay Tao has a really good breathing, a book on breathing disorders, but uh, I think it probably might, might be too deep for the average person. Um, but I guess that would be uh, probably not a bad place for people to start. I'm trying to see if I can uh, recognizing and treating breathing disorders. A multidisciplinary approach is the, is the title of the book. That would probably, if you're really looking for something good, that would be it. Awesome. awesome. All right. I've got a, right, a right, couple right, rapid right. fires for you. What book have you given most as a gift? How to win friends and influence people. Okay. Uh, How to win friends and influence people. Dale Carnegie without, without question by, by far more than any other. Love it. What is a belief that you hold that if others held would have the biggest effect on their life and or performance in general? Uh, life, marry the right person. Boom. <laughs> yeah. This, it says, marry the right person. That'll determine at least 90% of your happiness in the world. So, okay, Nice, nice. That's a new one. What is one action that you'd recommend people take immediately? Read. Read yeah. and read. Read and read more. Hell yeah, man. I couldn't agree more. Cool. This was great, Mike. Thank you so much. Uh, no, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hell yeah, man. Tell me about the, before we get, before we go, tell me about the DVD that you're about to release on uh, training youth. Uh, so actually April 4th, we're going to film it. It'll probably be out like April 4th, probably be up beginning of May. 
And I think we're going to call it complete youth training. So I've been doing this series with Pat Beath, Athletes Acceleration, that's been really, really successful. The format has worked really, really well. And it's basically like a three-hour lecture followed by a couple hours of practical. So we're going to go through this process of um, talking about about youth sports and about parenting and uh, you know long-term athlete development and relative age effect, a lot of these things. Then we're going to go through kind of live the, what we almost talked about here today, kind of the, the big the big four or five or six things that we really think kids should be learning when they're uh, when they're starting out when they're first beginning to train. Awesome, man. Where can people find out like where can they keep up with that? Where can they find out more about you? All of that kind of stuff. The biggest thing in terms of finding out if you just go to we've got uh, multiple uh, unfortunately multiple Facebook pages. I've got a strengthcoach.com one which is a my my sort of membership based website and then I've got a Michael Boyle one and we so I think if you go to either one of those on Facebook and like them both then you'll get those announcements when they come out. Awesome, man. Mike, thank you so much for your time, brother. I really appreciate this. Not a problem. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I apologize that I got to jump off and get on another call here, but uh, I got good, another, man. another one at three. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate it. Tell Hannah I said thank you too, Leah. I will. Have a great day. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.